Hi everyone, welcome to my video about how I made my renaissance dress. So um, I started this project about, well actually more than three weeks ago. I got the whole dress done in the three weeks and I had it done by my deadline. However, because it was such a short amount of time, I didn't get a lot of footage of me actually sewing the dress. I do have some, which I will be showing, but for the most part I'm just going to be explaining it to you and filling in bits of footage where I can for helpfulness. Also, this is a smaller project, so it doesn't have a large enough budget to make it 100% historically accurate as far as materials go, so I just kind of used whatever was available at on the fabric store online, and I will hopefully provide links down below. Okay, so a few days ago I placed an order for my fabric, well actually a few weeks ago I placed an order for my fabric, and usually it would arrive within two weeks, so I thought I had plenty of time and that it would come before yesterday, and then I could just do all the sewing this week because I have this week off. However, the company I buy my fabric from is was on backlog, and so they were they took a lot a lot longer than I expected to prepare my order and so I had to message them and say that hey I placed an order 11 days ago and can I please get it shipped as soon as you can as soon as convenience for you and they were able to ship it out that same day and um, the fabric is on its way but unfortunately it will not be here until next week and I do not have that week off, and that week is actually going to be very busy for me. So I can't just start sewing the dress when the fabric gets here. So I've got this whole week off with nothing to do, and the next week that's busy is the week the fabric comes. So my solution to this is I'm just going to do what I can with what I have, and I'm just going to do patterns and mock-ups this week and it's going to be very boring but um, I'm just going to prepare all of my patterns and all of my mock-ups so that when the fabric gets here I can just sew it all and get it all done and um, yeah so that's my plan. Welcome to Sewing a Renaissance Dress Extreme Sports Edition. As far as mock-ups go I actually didn't do a mock-up for the actual dress um, because I used the same pattern for the bodice of the dress that I did for the kirtle, so technically I kind of mocked up my dress bodice, but I used the same pattern from the kirtle mock-up. I did modify it a little bit, I cut in some extra seams for decoration and stuff, but other than that, most of my mock-ups were used for the undergarments. First up is the smock, which I actually have right here. Um, so this is the base undergarment that women wore directly against the skin and so you want to make sure this is made out of a breathable material because it's going to collect your sweat and everything else so you want to go with um for a renaissance smock you want linen uh, i didn't have enough in my budget for that so i settled for cotton which still works just as well i did not do a mock-up for this as you will be able to tell because this is basically just very simple shapes it's just rectangles and triangles so i will show you like a quick clip of how i did that pattern all right so let me walk you through my basic smock pattern so this is how the pattern is laid out for the smock this is actually a pretty simple pattern it's got um many squares and um just a couple triangles so this is basic shapes here. So the first piece you're going to need is the largest piece and this is your um, body piece that goes from your shoulders to the floor and this can be um, any length you like preferably from mid calf to the floor and mine is 52 inches by 20 inches and you're going to need two of these and obviously because um, a 40 inch circumference is not too big for a dress we're going to need some gussets to add to the side and I cut this out of leftover fabric and I ended up with four triangles that had a 10 inch base and a 40 inch height and you want this to go from your waist to however long your um however long you're going to whether it's the floor or your mid calf and 
And these are going to add some extra flair to the smock and it's important that it starts at the waist because you're going to be wearing a some stays with this and you don't want that to add bulk to your waistline. The next things we have are these sleeves and these ones are probably the second biggest. Um, mine are 25 inches wide and 35 inches long and these are pretty big sleeves. Um, they're extra wide and extra long so that they can add some bulk to the sleeves when we slash or pain our dress so that this fabric can show through the final uh, to in the final dress so you want to make your sleeves a little bit long and a little bit wide next I have my uh, my sleeve cuffs and this is optional sometimes you don't even need sleeve cuffs but I did and mine are just um, two by seven inches Next we have this underarm gusset and this is just a square and I did mine 4 by 4 inches and you basically just sew this in the armpit area to um, make sure you, you have a full range of motion. And for this particular style of smock I have a neckband or collar and this I don't have a specific measurement for, it's just 2 inches wide and it's a strip that goes around this neckline that I'm going to cut out. Um, a lot of uh, smocks, I keep wanting to say stays, a lot of smocks will, or chemises, will gather at the top or be pleated at the top, but the particular reference that I'm going for doesn't have any gathers or pleats, so that is why I just did this piece as wide as my shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder measurement. Cut out those shapes, then I sewed in the gussets, All right, so I just gathered my sleeve into the sleeve cuff and um, and then attached, well, I attached the sleeve cuff. My plan is to then fold the sleeve cuff over and hand stitch it down over top the seam in there. And I also ripped a, just like an inch or two out of the sleeve because I still need to be able to get my hand all the way through because you can make this, um, you, you can put hooks and buttons to make this part detachable, but that still means you have to get your hand through um, this part too. And then I cut out the neckline, attached the sleeves, and I also added embroidery as you can see here. This is uh, free motion embroidery, so it's not um, which means it's machine embroidered, so it's not historically accurate, but I thought it was a fun little detail. Maybe if you just search up Renaissance embroidery patterns, you may see something similar to this on Google Images, but I just literally picked the first one I saw and I was like, this is pretty, so I did that. Um, so yeah, here's the smock. You can't see the whole thing, but when I uh, I will have a reveal video where I show you the entire dress put together, and that will include like a little get ready with me or something like that. So you'll be able to see everything in that video. <sighs> All right, next is the stays and I have my stays right here. And this is what most people would call a corset, but it is not a corset. It is a stays or pair of bodies. For my stays, I scaled up a pattern from the internet. Once again, I just Google searched it and found a pattern that I liked. I guess most of my patterns and things came from quick Google searches because once again I was on a time crunch so I kind of just went with whatever I felt was appropriate for the era and for my personal preference. So yes, I picked up a pattern, scaled it up to my measurements, and I went through three mock-ups. The first mock-up I thought was too small but later it turned out that it was per the perfect size. Um, the second mock-up was pretty fun. I only had some black fabric and then this like tealish color and it ended up looking like it was from some sort of Tim Burton film and I thought that was really funny because I was actually watching a Tim Burton movie whilst making that mock-up and then my last mock-up I just kind of um I just inserted bones into my first mock-up and finished that up and it came out pretty good Basically how you construct these stays is you're going to sandwich 
two of each pattern piece together and sew these little repetitive uh, boning channels. And as you can see here on my stays, there are boning channels all over this thing. And it's actually kind of satisfying to me because it's like having, it's very sturdy and I don't know, I just kind of like the way it looks. And then I hand bound the top and bottom edges of my stays. Well, I mean, after I did the boning channels, first I pieced it together and then I bound the edges. And this was a lot of hand sewing, so it was kind of tedious, but yeah. Overall, there wasn't a lot I had to do because there wasn't any flossing. I did have to finish these little buttonholes. Basically, you lace this a lot differently than you would lace a corset. Corsets are typically laced crisscross or like with the bunny ears method. Um, which is my favorite method, but historically for these ones you want to spiral lace them, which means your laces are going in and out in like a big spiral shape. So I have this really, really long piece of string and it's balled up so it doesn't get tangled. And what I've done is I have glued the end of it to keep it from fraying and I just basically can put it through each of the eyelet holes, and I lace this thing up every single time I wear it. So I, I was trying to make it so that I could loosen it and then get it over my head, but, uh, and then I'd only have to unlace the little bows on the, the tabs, but that didn't work out. So now every time I wear my stays, I have to lace and unlace them. So yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to explain to you how to make or how to draft your own farthingale pattern. So this pattern is really simple because all you need is a rectangle and a triangle. And this is a paper mock-up I have done. On my mock-up you can see we've got a rectangle in the front, a rectangle in the back, and then we've got two gores on either side. And these are the triangles. This is half your waist measurement by your height from the floor to your waist. Then this piece is a little bit more complicated, but you're going to subtract your total waist measurement from the circumference of your bottom hoop and divide that by four because we have four triangles. One, two, three, four. And that number is going to be the length of the base of your triangle. And then the height of your triangle is, of course, going to, once again, be your height from the floor to your waist. And then you're going to draw, and I just used a ruler to draw to connect these two lines and get the hypotenuse. Um, however, uh, this isn't finished yet, because if you were to just sew it like this, you'd notice that you'd get a very flat silhouette, and your crinoline, or not crinoline, farthingale, would kind of have, the, this This is what it would look like from the front and then from the side it'd look something like this. And you don't want that because we're not going for like a flat 18th century silhouette. We want to have a nice cone shape. So to get that, um, the reason that it doesn't do that is because the hypotenuse is not the same length as the rectangle. So we need to make this the same length. And to do that, you're just gonna simply fold your triangle in half and you're going to connect the side that is your height which mine is just 42 inches so I'm going to make sure that 42 inches obviously this is scaled down so this isn't really 42 inches but yeah so you're just going to fold that and now we have this and you can cut it cut off this extra bit like that and then you kind of get a kind of geometric-y looking shape. So I just kind of round it off a little bit. And that is how you get your triangle. And then that way when you sew it together, instead of having a silhouette like this, it can lie flat like this. And then you can get a nice cone shape. All right, let's talk about bones for a minute because when you make a crinoline or hoop skirt or farthingale, no matter 
what it's called. You want to have very strong bones because you don't want the weight of the skirt to collapse your crinoline. Now, the only, the only boning I had available is this very flimsy synthetic boning, and I cut out two layers of this, and obviously this is not going to be strong enough to support the skirt, and it's going to collapse. So I'm using a combination of this boning, because it's like pretty much the only boning I have on hand right now, and I'm also using some steel wire, and this is very sturdy. And it, it, as thin as it is, it is pretty sturdy and it will not collapse. And I'm using this on just three of the hoops I have because I didn't have enough to do all five hoops. So it's going to be on the top hoop, the bottom hoop, and the middle hoop. So I have five hoops and so it's going to be on three of them. And that should give me enough sturdiness to keep the skirt from collapsing. And I personally don't think that this combo is strong enough to support my Cinderella dress, but I think it'll work for this project because I don't have that many layers in this Renaissance dress. All right, so here is the first mock-up. <laughs> it's, I feel a little bit silly in this, not gonna lie. Um, it's not as elegant as my crinoline, I would say but I don't hate it. I don't, I don't hate it. Um, the only thing I do hate are these hideous boning channels because I did not cut them on the bias and I stitched them on so carelessly so it's very wrinkly so apologies for that. Um, in the back you'll see my bones are not finished. That's just so that I can adjust them if I need to. But yeah, here's the overall silhouette. It's pretty sturdy. I think the steel wire really helped because I tried this on with my heaviest skirt. Well, actually, no. I didn't try it on with my Cinderella dress, but I tried it on with a really heavy skirt and it didn't collapse at all. Um, you'll see that this does look a little bit flimsy, but like up here and a little bit lower, the steel wire boning channels are very sturdy. And it's easy to sit in. It's very flexible, but still sturdy enough to support a skirt. Um, so, yep, we'll just see what we can do from here. So basically, I repeated those steps with my real fabric that I was using, and I also, you know, fixed those boning channels and stitched them down a lot neater. Um, I'm pretty happy with the result. It came out really good. The only thing that I would kind of address in hindsight is that the steel wire works really well, like it supports the dress, but storage wise it is kind of hard to store because it can get bent out of shape so every time I wear it I'll have to like rebend it. It's not too much trouble but I guess maybe it wasn't my best idea but I mean I think it's still a good solution considering that I didn't have any uh, steel boning on hand. Next we have the bum roll. I know it sounds kind of silly but this is just a little it's kind of like a neck pillow, but it goes around your hips, and it it's meant to make the dress kind of have this kind of shape, you know. And um, I didn't get any footage of me making this, but it's fairly simple. I did a mock-up beforehand. This stretched out over time, so it is now a little bit too big to go around my waist, but it still works. But basically, it's a, a pillow. Yep, it's stuffed with stuffing and cabbage and... For those of you who aren't historical nerds, cabbage is just another term for leftover fabric that's chopped up into bits. But it's basically just, I don't, I don't know how else to explain it. It's a pillow. I cut out two C shapes or crescent shapes, stitched them together, stuffed it up, and then attached these two ribbons so that I could tie it. And that's all I did. Now this next piece of clothing is kind of confusing to some people. This is a partlet. This is not attached to a dress. It is just like a little thing that goes over your neck and then it ties under the bust with little strings. And then I um, added a little hook at the top of mine so I could keep it closed at the neck. And it could be worn open or closed depending on how you fancy it. But yeah, basically, you cut out the this general shape 
I draped it on my dress form beforehand so that I could get an accurate depiction of what that should look like. And then I embellished the neck ruffle with box pleats. And I think these are so satisfying because they came out so good, especially after being steamed with the iron. And then I also attached this strip of lace to the top as well, and some lace down the edges of the front. I also hand sewed a lot of these hems, but you don't have to do that. I just had a lot of time. Well, I said I had a lot of time. I was in a time crunch, but this I made this out of scraps during the week where my fabric wasn't here, so I did have time then to make this. If you want a clearer explanation on how to make one of these, I will be making something very similar to one of them. It's called a chemise set, and when I do my Emma project, I will show you how to make a chemise set. So the patterning and process will be very similar, so stay tuned for that. Now we have the kirtle, which I also don't have footage of making because I worked on this backstage during a show. This is a dress that could be worn underneath your gown, or sometimes I think kirtles could have just been worn um, as they are, maybe if you were a peasant. But basically I draped my bodice on my dress form beforehand, and I kept the bodice pattern the same for the actual dress, which you'll see in a minute, but I kept it the same so that it would lie nice and flat underneath. Um, but here's the inside of it. I did add some embroidery to the front and back. You can't see this very well, but you know, we'll have a reveal. You'll get to see everything in detail, it's fine. But this this wasn't necessary, I just had a few hours where I had nothing to do, so I embroidered that as well. And I also, oh yeah, there's some down this front side too. This is also spiral laced, and it also um, laces at the top with the sleeves, and then these ones are just for decorative purposes, but there's two curved seams with laces in the back as well. And I made this one lace in front to make it easier to get in and out of by myself. Um, and the lacing is very similar to that of the stays, so I pretty much just laced that the same. This is a very historically inaccurate color. It's a bright sunflower yellow, but no matter, it's still pretty. As for the skirt, the skirt is rather large and to do this I did this very similar to my Cinderella skirt but I folded my fabric over three times and then I had the top of the fabric edge and um, I cut out in the very middle my waist measurement so that it would I would have three times my waist measurement so that when I gathered it it would give me you know nice neat gathers and then I cut that waist measurement on a diagonal to connect to the total width of my fabric and then that gave me these big trapezoids and then you also have these little triangles on the sides which don't have any use so I just flip those upside down and sew them into the trapezoids as well and so that gives you some extra flare in your skirt and if you're just curious about what this is made out of it's just poly cotton so yeah it's not not historically accurate either, but I think it's pretty. <laughs> For the dress, I made a boned bodice lining, and it's single layered because we already have so many layers going around our to torso, so we really don't need much more. So I made that single layered, and like I said, it was the same pattern as the kirtle. And then I dug into my velvet. Now when working with velvet, there's many important things to remember. The velvet has a nap, which is these little hairs that stick out of the fabric. And depending on which way it goes, it'll give you either a very shiny velvet or a more coarse velvet. And this is important for two reason reasons. First, you don't want to iron the velvet because you may crush these little hairs, causing the fabric to have the nap pointing in different directions permanently, and it may look a little funky. This is a style that can be used in different types of clothing, but preferably for this dress, I did not want to have crushed velvet, so I did not iron my fabric at all. The second important thing to remember with the nap is when you cut the fabric, it's going to have a different shade depending on which direction the nap is facing. So when you're cutting the fabric, you either want to cut against the nap, 
or down towards the direction of the nap. I wanted a shiny velvet dress, so I marked with chalk on my fabric where the nap was pointing and cut out my fabric likewise. I also added sleeves to my dress, and you don't have to do this, but I wanted sleeves for my dress. I used a simplicity sleeve pattern, so it was just a pattern that I've used before. And that little curved part at the top that goes over the shoulder, I snipped that off so that I could add these little decorative tabs. This is a style um, in the Renaissance era that is called painting, where you insert pieces of fabric that are decorative or maybe just a different fabric or the same fabric. It, do it doesn't matter what fabric it is, but I made mine fancy. And they go, they attach the sleeve to the dress. Sometimes they are detachable so that they could be in, so sleeves could be interchangeable, but I just sewed mine. And the idea is that your smock sleeves are going to peek through the, these little holes to show off your status. The second method of showing off this extra fabric is called slashing, which is what I did to the elbow of my sleeve. I just cut holes and finished the seams. And then I added a lot of ribbon to my bodice. Okay, here's a quick update on the bodice. I have done a lot of work. It's not finished yet, but I do love how it looks. So I went ahead and attached my sleeves. I love the combination of like these, this bluish teal with the very rich burgundy. And I added some ribbon to the sleeves and there's lots of trim on this. There's trim decorating the front and the back. And I especially love these curved seams. I think those are really pretty. Uh, this, this bodice is not finished. Um, I'm still going to add some hook and eyes to close it in the front. Now for the skirt, I basically constructed it identically to my kirtle skirt as well with the same trapezoid gore method. Now you may, uh, if you caught that, you may realize that when I flip my triangles, upside down. The nap is now going to be po pointing in a different direction. Um, when I got my fabric, I draped it with the nap facing the dif the opposite direction of where, where I cut my skirt panels, and there wasn't too much of a dramatic difference, but basically this was the dark side, this was the light side, and this the sides running here and here were kind of neutral so that when I flipped this piece over, it didn't have that much of a difference from the nap on this side. So the skirt still worked out. I also added a train to my skirt, which meant that I just um, left the, the width of my fabric the same. To make the train, I had panels of 60 inches wide down the back, and then panels that were 45 inches long running down the sides, and then I just draped that on my dress form and then cut it away until I got the shape of a train that I liked. After I cut away that extra fabric, I just did a rolled hem along the bottom, and that worked out pretty fine. I was going to put some trim, but I didn't have enough trim left, so I just did it running down the sides of the front opening. And speaking of, you know, the front opening, that's how I closed my skirt, is I just had a little hook at the top, well, actually two hooks at the top, and then I just left the two sides hanging. You technically don't have to finish the fabric edges, but I still did because I just wanted the, see the hem to be more sturdy, so I still hemmed it anyway. And then I gathered that all into a waistband, and here's where it kind of went wrong, because you probably don't want to gather five yards of velvet fabric into one waistband. That was a bad idea. You really don't need that much fabric. So you probably don't even have to add the gores. Well, actually the top of the gores don't really have much width to them anyway. So you can probably still add those, but reduce the fabric that is gathered into your waist. Probably do only twice as much as your waist measurement and not three times as much because there was so much fabric gathered into that waist band that I almost murdered my sewing machine. So don't do that. My machine, I thought it wasn't going to work again because it was that bad. It would, then I broke like six needles. Take my warning and don't gather five yards of velvet into your waist measurement. 
For the French hood, I followed some patterns off the internet to get the general shape. I just did a mock-up as well. And then I hand sewed wire into the edges, so there's like a little um, headband piece that goes around the back of your head. So there's wire sewn into that, and then the little hood part has wire sewn into that as well. I also cut out some interfacing to go inside the little hood part so that it would be nice and sturdy. And then I covered it in the velvet to match the dress. Next, I put on the veil, and this is just made out of some polyester chiffon, and it's cut in a little half circle, but to get a more accurate shape, I pinned it to the hood, and then I just cut away the excess until it was the shape I wanted when it was draping down. And then I embellished it with lace and beads and pearls, and I'll show you what that looks like. So here's the French hood. So you can see I added some more of this trim to the top and bottom. And I added some of these little seed beads. My camera does not want to focus, so I'll, you'll see it later. But it's got these seed beads sewn in a crisscross pattern. And then in, where it crosses on each of the, the bead lines, I have glued a little pearl because pearls were a big thing in the Renaissance era. And I also added some lace trim to the veil as well. And you can, yeah, you can see the headband in there, but this is like one of my favorite costume pieces by far that I've ever made. I'm still amazed that I was able to design and construct an entire project, like undergarments and all, within three weeks. And, like, that's like a record for me. I've never done anything like this. And so that is the tale of how I made that dress in three weeks and wore it to the Renaissance Fair and had a great time. I don't have a reveal for you right now, so hopefully these photos will suffice. But yes, there will be a reveal that will include more close-up shots of each of the items that I've shown you today, and then, like, a you know, me frolicking in the woods somewhere, hopefully. And yeah, so be on the lookout for that. And also be on the lookout for my new series, which is me making the Emma dress. Um, well, she wears several dresses, but I'm going to be making this one, which is like her yellow dress. So yeah, be on the lookout for that because that's going to be fun and I can't wait to see you there. Look at all this floor that isn't occupied by a ball gown. Now we're going to make another ball gown to, uh, to fill it back up with some... What am I doing? It's finally here! I'm just going to scribble out my address real quick so you can't see it. I actually don't know what to scribble out, so I'm just scribbling out everything. I like ordering packages for myself because it's like getting your own present in the mail. I just remember this is fabric, so I guess I shouldn't cut it too much. Oh my gosh! This velvet! It's so pretty! Okay, here's the first victim. And it is so, oh, it's so soft. Oh, this is gorgeous. I feel like a curtain. Oh, it's so pretty! Ooh. Boring old standard cotton muslin for, um, for the undergarments, but hey, natural fibers. We can be excited about that. Um, I guess most of these are just um, quick Google searches. <laughs> Let me read my notes because I forgot where I was. So basically I repeated those steps with my regular, for with my out of some wool. <laughs> Hold on, let me start over. I am pleasantly surprised. <laughs> What's with my voice cracks? Gosh. But yeah. You'll like my zit. It's very, very noticeable. Okay, so very important special note. Um, if you decide to add a train to your dress, you kind of should remember that it's there. I went outside with this thing to try it on, and I just took a couple steps outside. There was still chalk drawings on the on the ground. My mom was like, oh, there's something on your dress. And I turned around and the entire back of this was covered in chalk dust. And I started panicking. Um, 
but it wasn't something that a little uh, damp washcloth couldn't fix, so I was able to just clean it up real quick, but yeah, bless you Crayola for making your products washable, and um, yeah, if you're wearing a dress with a train, you gotta remind yourself that it's there, just say <laughs> How much of... Yeah, so just don't, don't fire into the edges, uh, into all of the edges 